Hello everybody, this is going to be your adapted physical activity overview for lecture number five. If we look at our schedule, we will see that we're talking about a meal planning worksheet uh, that's going to be doing your discussion and we're going to review for your midterm. So next week is your midterm, you'll have all week to complete the midterm. It'll be uh, multiple choice and 5% of your grade. And I'm going to go over the adaptive physical activity overview with you now and then go over your meal planning assignment for this week. Okay, so here we have adaptive physical activity. Uh, showing you some adapted physical activities. Here we see an individual coming out of their motorized wheelchair to perform modified pull-ups. They also have a bike here that they can use with their hands, so adapting cardio for them and adapting uh, weight training for them using this modified bar. Um, also incorporating inclusion, uh, so if the individual isn't able to walk, stand, or move their arms, still completing activities that are adaptable for them and including them anyway. Here we have um, limbo. So we have this individual who is in a wheelchair being pushed through the limbo. Uh, here we have a student utilizing the cones because it was a really fun game that kind of motivated that individual to uh, take part in lab. Um, here we have individuals using noodles in lab uh, to get warmed up before they get into the pool. And here we have the parachute, which is always one of the best exercises for all people to be included in. So different adaptive physical activities to look at here. So adaptive physical activity, where does it come from? Well, it comes from defining uh, uh, physical activity is any bodily movement that results in energy expenditure. So anytime that you burn calories, it could be cleaning, it could be cooking, it could be uh, shaking, it could be dancing it be a lot of different things so there's exercise exercise in any physical activity that is planned okay exercise is planned structured and repetitive for the purpose of improving or maintaining one or more components of fitness physical education is an academic subject that provides a planned sequential k-12 through standards based program of curricula and instruction designed to develop motor skills knowledge and behaviors for healthy active living physical fitness sportsmanship self-efficacy and emotional intelligence so that is what physical education is. Uh, there is what is called Comprehensive School Physical Activity Program, which encompasses physical education as its main um, component, but it also has physical activity during school, staff development, family and community engagement, physical activity before and after school. So different ways to become physically active. There's a term called physical literacy. Uh, to pursue a lifetime of healthful physical activity, a physical literate individual has learned the skills necessary to participate in a variety of physical activities. So there's definitely going to be a lot of skills that people need to learn. Knows the implication and benefits of involvement in various types of physical activities. Participates regularly in physical activity. Is physically active and values physical activity and its contributions to a healthful lifestyle. Um, policy and environment. Every student is required to take daily physical activity. Education grades K-12 with instruction periods totaling 150 minutes a week in elementary 20 and 225 minutes a week in middle and high school. Okay, now this isn't um, you know these are the state standards, but uh, these are the um, national standards, but the states can define their own uh, curricula. Uh, school districts and schools require full inclusion of all students in physical education, so all students. And that's kind of why we put this in here is because all students are included, including individuals with disabilities. And if they're not able to be included, they need an adaptive physical education teacher. School districts and schools do not allow student exemptions from physical education, class time, or credit requirements. Um, school districts and school prohibit students from substituting their activities. Uh, for physical education class or time requirement and credit requirements. So these are again all from the national uh, state guideline or national guidelines so the states may be different. Physical activity is not assigned or withheld as punishment so we're not allowed to assign physical activity as punishment so don't have students perform burpees when they get out. Uh, physical education is taught by state licensed or state certified teacher, teacher who is endorsed to teach physical education so that's policy environment. Student assessment. Student assessment is aligned with national and or state standards established grade level outcomes and include written physical education curriculum along with administration protocols. Student assessment includes evidence-based practices that measure student achievement in all areas of instruction including physical fitness, uh, 
uh, social health and uh, mental health. Grading is related directly to the student learning objectives identified in the written physical education curriculum and the physical education teacher follows school district and school protocols for reporting and communicating student progress to student and parents. So it's the job of the physical education teacher to assess students, create a um, positive environment to inform people of physical literacy and what that means and to become physically more active. What is adapted physical activity? APA for short is physical activity that has been adapted to fit the needs of individuals with a variety of disabilities including but not limited to individuals with intellectual disabilities um, intellectual and with disabilities uh, so that's going to basically mean all individuals with disabilities so adaptive physical education teacher conduct individualized education plans or IEPs to enhance the affective psychomotor and cognitive levels in individuals with severe disabilities in their school districts so most individuals uh, with disabilities have an IEP and in some circumstances the a adaptive physical education teacher works alongside a physical uh, physical therapist and occupational therapist in their community to implement evidence-based practices to enhance physical activity levels of individuals with disabilities adaptive physical education also utilizes the least restrictive environment LRE approach which states that the learner with disabilities must be taught in the least restrictive environment in order to be successful. This means taking them to a setting where they can be most productive. For some individuals it is out of their wheelchair or onto a stretching table. For others it is in the pool. Some may not be allowed to be taken out of their wheelchairs. So I corrected that up here. It just should have said individuals with disabilities so I just to make that clear. Inclusive physical activity or IPA ensures everyone has the capability to participate in physical activities in one setting. IPA believes that all environments can be adapted to fit the needs of all learners regardless of the participants ability level. So here we have an example of everyone partaking in the parachute. Okay. IPA is also related to the uni unified sport setting where individuals with disabilities are teamed with individuals without disabilities. I can do it here, recognizes this, and utilizes this teaching strategy to include everyone. Future implications, it is encouraged that individuals over the age of 16 begin to transfer skills learned from adaptive physical education teachers and begin to partake in Special Olympics, sporting events such as bowling, bocce, disc golf, basketball, soccer, football, and cheerleading, t-ball, or another activity. If such activities are still unattainable, then the individual can look at other options which are more cooperative, including but not limited to yoga, dance, ballet, fitness, swimming, walking clubs, run club, rowing club, adventure challenges, and they can become members of at fitness centers. Still, more needs to be done for this population. Okay, uh, This comes from the APINS, Adaptive Physical Education National Standards. Um, adaptive Physical Education is physical education which has been adapted or modified so that, that is appropriate for the person with disability as it is for a person without a disability. So really just taking regular physical education and just adapting it for anybody. Federal law mandates that physical education be provided to students with disabilities and defines physical education as a development of physical and motor skills, fundamental motor skills and patterns, throwing, catching, walking, running, etc. Skills in aquatics, dance and individual and group games and sports including intramural and lifetime sports. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 1990 uses the term disability as a diagnostic category that qualifies students for special services. These categories include autism, spectrum disorder, deafness or blindness, deafness, hearing impairment, intellectual disability, multiple disabilities, orthopedic impairments, other health impairments, serious emotional disturbance, special learning disability, speech or language impairment, traumatic brain injury, visual impairment including blindness, and the services are provided by an adaptive physical education teacher include planning services, assessment of individuals, ecosystems, prescription slash placement, the IEP, teaching, counseling, coaching, evaluation of services, coordination of resources and consulting, and advocacy. More can be found on the APINS website. Key terms you need to know as an adaptive physical activity specialist or a physical education teacher. Um, we've gone over adaptive physical education, we've talked about inclusion, which refers to educating students with and without disabilities within the same environment. We talked about least restrictive environment. Um, we talked about IDEA uh, and special education is something that we haven't talked about 
today yet, but the term special education means specifically designed instruction at no cost to parents or guardians to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability, including instruction conducted in the classroom, in the home, in the hospitals, and institutions, in other settings, and in physical education. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act provides that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability solely by reason of that disability be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So any program that receives federal financial assistance cannot deny anyone because of any type of uh, ability impairment. What do we teach? We look at cognitive, psychomotor, and affective, or academic, physical, and social and emotional. Physical activity is one of the few areas that allows for the development of all three domains that are so important to the growth and development. So whereas a lot of classes or um, a lot of area or specialties look at just the cognitive and social emotional domain, this is the only class that looks at all three. So psychomotor, balance, coordination, eye-hand coordination, gross motor development, development of body, kinesthetic, tactile, and spatial learning styles, cardiovascular fitness, muscular strength and endurance, and flexibility, cognitive, development of learning styles, musical, rhythmic, verbal, spatial, auditory, verbal, naturalist, and mathematical, logical, number of awareness and math concepts, vocabulary, literacy, and reading skill development, learning and following directions, following auditory cues or visual cues, sequencing skills, and problem solving. Social and emotional domain, non-competitive, non-aggressive, non-violent, gender equal, all age inclusive, culturally adaptive, work alone or with a partner or in a small group, development of intra and interpersonal learning styles. We've gone over this before, effective teaching strategies for a teaching adapted physical activity. We talked about the different teaching styles, command, task, guided, discovery, and problem solving. Uh, we've talked about motor learning, how there's whole methods and part methods, and when to use uh, either or. I definitely want to use a part method when we're doing stuff like dance, and a whole method when we're doing something like running or throwing, right? So progressive part method, parts are taught in a progressive manner so you may have to break a skill down like throwing or something like jumping to its fundamental level like you know um, bringing your hips back and moving your arms up and down or that type of thing and kind of progressing into the skill instructional model or sorry facilitating skill development we look at task analysis activity analysis and modifying activities Instructional models, look at individualized instruction. We have an I can uh, model, create social leisure, and, and the above. Uh, developmentally appropriate behavior management, so directing guidance, physical guidance, uh, eye contact, body posture, vocal quality, and proximity. Uh, verbal guidance and uh, eye contact and body posture, vocal quality, and proximity are some of the most effective teaching strategies we can look at as teachers because the more that we uh, engage our learners and the, the better body posture that we have and vocal quality that we have and proximity we have and guidance we give the more that they're going to be able to learn and effective guidance uh, looking at verbal skills and working with others we have indirect guidance uh, we have program planning recommendations that you should know about, and then we have different physical act education national standards that we look at for adapted physical activity, and these are all reviewed. <coughs> we have our five standards, if you didn't know. These are our national standards for K-12. through As far as getting back into adapted physical activity, Game and sport modifications, so in badminton, you could use an oversized racket, you could use larger birdies, lower the net, allow students to sit, eliminate the net, use a balloon instead of a birdie. Uh, basketball, you could use a smaller, lighter ball, use a different type of ball, a playground ball, lower the goal, use a goal with a larger circumference, decrease size of playing area. Bowling, you could use a lighter ball, decrease number of pins, allow students to push ball while sitting, I use a bowling ramp, allow three tries instead of two, increase size of pins, 
uh, create visual lanes with cones. I would say also you can put bells on top of the, the bowling pins to make noise when they fall down. Uh, floor hockey, use oversized sticks, use lighter sticks, use larger ball or puck, increase size of the goal, decrease size of playing area, and eliminate goalies. Kickball, use a lighter large ball, even though I wouldn't really teach it unless, you know, we're at a recreational camp and they were performing physical activities all day. I may teach kickball. Um, larger ball allows students to use hockey stick uh, if they needed to, if they utilize a wheelchair. Decreased distances to base allows students to kick ball when stationary and allow pitcher to use a bowling ramp. Soccer, you could use a lighter large ball, allow students to use a hockey stick instead of kicking the ball. Decreased size of playing area allows students to play with a buddy, allows students to walk to ball or roll wheelchair to ball, increase size of goal. So I know that if you're not playing soccer, you can also just uh, play hockey instead since it's the same concept, the ball stays on the ground and you're not bouncing it. Softball, use a lighter ball, larger ball, bright ball, use a lighter bat. Um, you can put a bell or a ringing noise inside of any of these balls. So um, maybe trying to find an advanced basketball or soccer ball that has a um, maybe a blinker or a uh, or a, a sound or a bell that goes off when you kick it. Um, that would be kind of cool for somebody who is blind. Um, allow more than three strikes for softball. Use a batting tee. Allow more time to get to bases and identify bases with specific colors. For volleyball, you could use a balloon. You could lower the net. You could eliminate the net. Decrease the court side court size, allow ball to bounce before hitting, allow a limited number of hits, and allow more than one try when serving. So giving individuals more options and reducing the rules for individuals is really important and not playing literally and just trying to have a good time. And then, you know, after a good time, you know, then you might want to try to make the rules a little bit more strict, but I would start off with having less rules. So there's different ways we can assess learning. We can create checklists. We can utilize rubrics. Uh, we, can, we can look at it in a task analysis sequence. Um, what, do we, uh, what to assess? Well, we look at the physical, social, and cognitive, but we definitely look more at the physical side of things. Um, how? We use the Brockport Physical Fitness Test. So you could always check that out if you just type in Brockport physical fitness test and this would be a great resource if you um, need to test your students in any of these areas and um, you can also purchase uh, the actual book and you can see here an example of what you would actually see on that test. So you might see body composition, aerobic function, the, the pacer, uh, musculoskeletal function, flexibility. Okay, so this would be more in lines um, with adaptive physical education teachers in the education setting. Okay, for our class specifically, since we work in groups, um, we don't assess as much, but we do um, do a lot of social interaction and I do most of the assessment from above. Tests of gro gross motor development, so this is the TGMD, and this looks at object control and locomotor skills, and it takes those and it, uh, I'll actually show you here. So if you check out TGMD, there's actually a new version now, which is number three. Uh, so you just click on three, third edition. So we have three, number three, you can get that test. It's a good one to have if you're looking at fundamental motor skills or gross motor development. Uh, TGM3 is very reliable. All right, so there are individual education programs, which we've talked about. There are measurable goals, which are short and long-term goals related to the IEP. And there's present level of performance, which is the cornerstone of the IEP. This includes statements of how disability affects a child progress in general curriculum. So present level performance what they're currently able to do. 
as far as potential modifications and adaptations, you can change the equipment, you can change the rules, you can change the environment, and you can change the instruction. And this gives you examples and lists of different types of instruction, different types of environment, different types of rules, and different types of equipment. Here's an example of a parachute task progression. So you could create a task progression for any skill or any activity that you teach and you can create uh, levels to the skill that um, you can assess your learners to see what level they're at. Okay. Here an example of Nutrition Pictionary, uh, working on physical literacy, uh, also working on cognitive domain, and the social domain here, working together in groups here. We have physical or psychomotor domain. Here we have adaptations and modifications using a different type of a net, lowering the net, here we have using balloons instead of um, a wiffle ball, and here we have this individual utilizing a scooter for upper body work. That was an overview of adaptive physical activity. Other ways to adapt is have individuals sit in a chair if it's too, um, too much to stand. Um, you can use the noodles for balance. You can create partner games with noodles. We roll a ball back and forth and you can have three people um, per group. Uh, here we have an individual that utilizes his wheelchair. That he can go vertical and he's doing a lightsaber Star Wars game with his buddy. And then here we have a girl. Um, she's pushing the medicine ball while she's sitting. Other adaptations, you have to make it worthwhile for students. They have to be having fun and adapt equipment that works best for them. Here we're using a exercise ball for soccer, an exercise ball for dance, an exercise ball for soccer here again. Uh, we have a bowling ramp made out of a mat. Here we have a upside down uh, ultimate frisbee to use to collect wiffle balls. We have a noodle used as a hockey stick and a wiffle ball used as a hockey puck. We have two scooters put together for a fun game where he utilizes upper body strength and balancing skills. Here we have some adapted equipment with the balls tied to the equipment so that they have more trials and more repetition so the ball doesn't go flying away. Here we have some noodles uh, in a square where a student is doing some lateral uh, or side steps around the square and we have a yarn ball here on a tennis racket instead of a tennis ball and this is the way that you adapt uh, so that you can progress. Visual guides and sequencing progression. So typically you'll find educators, uh, mentors, or people that create schedules uh, to use pictures so that they can show the individual what they're going to perform and how many and, and what to do after. So for example, we're going to perform shoulder shrugs, perform 30 reps or for 30 seconds, and then after you perform that, you just you check off trial one, and then you check off as many trials as you happen to do and then you go to the next one reach overhead perform 30 reps or 30 seconds and then check off whatever one you do and here's another way uh, as many reps in 30 seconds and then you can put the number of reps in the circle and you can do that for it looks like um, 10 trials uh, maybe uh, maybe you give them a 10 week plan where they have to do this once a day or twice a day and they just put in how many reps they do each time and you do it you know as many days as you want they can color it in as well here we have just some directions and pictures spinal twist uh, roll up and stuff like that and this is just showing you different visual guides and sequencing progressions here would be a visual guide for the pool for an individual with multiple disabilities uh, how long it's going to take them for each activity and what they're going to do at each activity and a picture of what they're going to do at each activity here we have another uh, guide in the gym in the gym setting: hockey, bowling, nutrition, and weight training. So a variety of sports skills, nutrition, learning, and weight training with a picture that goes along with it. Here we have swim sequencing. So if you're sequencing swim skills, this is um, basically the order of operation that we would do it in this lab, and some games that you can also play. Uh, with your lab. So this is another way of sequencing or planning for activity. And These are the full lesson plans that we fill out, but these are the guides that we use to help 
individuals learn. So although there's a lot of writing and, 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 and work to create lesson plans and just going back to our lesson plan folder, you'll notice that um, they don't look too visual to begin. They actually um, look like there's a lot going on. So for example, if you look at our adapted lesson plan template, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff we need to fill in first before we get to the pictures here. So this is what we're looking at here. Okay, so here's the instruction and in pictures. So this would just be the end of the lesson plan, and this would be the part of the lesson plan that we show our mentees, and this would be part of the lesson plan that we show our evaluators, if that makes sense. So I look at this portion to see what you need and see what you've done and see how you're planning, and then this portion is really for you to teach your mentee or mentees. As far as nutrition goes, this is something new that we're going to talk about and we're going to get into our nutrition plan project and your assignment for this week. So nutrition for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, there are nutrition standards of care and these are used by personal assistants, service providers, healthcare providers, nutrition professionals, and family members. The goal of this nutrition standard of care is to promote quality food and nutrition supports for adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities. These standards and practice guidelines are designed to help person, personal assistants, direct service staff, and others to create and maintain environments that promote all three levels of healthy nutrition. Level 1, adequate nutrition. Level 2, individualized nutrition. And level 3, health promoting nutrition. A background. So research shows that a healthy diet would improve the quality and length of most individuals' lives. Poor diet is related to obesity and illnesses such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension. Individuals with primary disabilities often experience secondary conditions, additional physical and psychological problems that limit a person's enjoyment of life and participation activities. Health research conducted with adults who have IDD show that diet affects many of their most fre frequently reported secondary conditions such as fatigue, weight problems, and constipation or diarrhea. Proper nutrition can increase these individuals' quality of life by improving existing secondary conditions and preventing additional conditions from developing. Personal assistance and other others responsible for nutrition or planning and preparing meals for ad adults with IDD should read the standards of care and understand how to implement them. Training in safe food handling practices and basic nutrition is necessary. The resources section lists food safety and basic nutrition training materials, including some designed specifically for a supportive living staff. So minimal standards for care for adults is provide health promoting food and nutrition supports, provide information, knowledgeable encouragement, and positive social instru instrumental supports, assist in grocery shopping, cooking, etc. to help individuals make good food choices and support participation in activities that encourage healthy eating and physical activity and that's exactly what we're going to try to do in this lab and that's the standard and so we're just trying to deliver the standards for people with disabilities uh, when it comes to nutrition as well as physical activity there are rights nutrition rights for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities they have the right to expect national support from providers who respect their needs, and that's going to be us. A nutritious and adequate diet based on scientific health and nu nutrition research, and that's what you're going to be looking at uh, after this uh, assignment. A culturally acceptable diet that promotes the individual's health and meets individual's needs. Safely prepared and stored food served in a ple pleasant atmosphere. So we'll pr try to do that in a fun atmosphere here in lab. A variety of diet of fresh, whole, and minimally processed foods, so not using a lot of packaged foods, trying to start with whole foods. Choices of foods to include or exclude from an individual's diet. So ongoing information about individual dietary needs and appropriate foods to meet those needs. Representation in population-based food and nutrition research studies to ensure that findings generalized to and are useful for people with disabilities. Fair and respectful treatment from food and nutritional professionals. 
there are the three levels of standard care for people with disabilities is that one diet is safe and adequate food is of adequate quality and amount variety of fruits vegetables and whole grains food is safely stored and prepared menus of three meals and snacks per day regular physical activity respects individual food preferences. So that'd be level one. Level two, diet meets their individual needs. The six components of level one plus manages medical conditions, manages secondary conditions, and meets other special needs. Diet three, diet promotes health. The six components of level one plus the three components of level two plus abundant whole plant foods, low cholesterol, saturated and trans fat foods, limited simple sugars, and salt more plant proteins, beans, nuts, and grains, and fewer and leaner animal proteins like meat. Multiple vitamin, mineral supplement, and little to no alcohol. And good point on the animal, we, we're not going to use any animal products for our meal planning, so that's something I want you to stay away from. As far as the different disabilities and their nutrition diagnosis and etiology and are signed of symptoms, so um, ASD or autism spectrum disorder is a group of developmental disabilities that are characterized by delayed speech and language development, ritualistic or repetitive behaviors and impairments in social interactions. Individuals may also have delays in feeding skills and the ability to self-feed. Okay. Nutritional diagnosis, sometimes inadequate energy intake, limited food acceptance, so um, maybe eating the same foods all the time. Uh, inadequate intake of calcium, vitamin D, iron, or other nutrients, underweight, overweight, or obesity. Uh, so for energy intake, so the limited food choices can be an issue for people with ASD. Um, sometimes they avoid certain foods or food groups because they're not, um, you know, if their parents think that they're going to be behaviorally more sound eating the same things and they typically aren't going to change. Okay, limited food choices and complementary and alternative medicine treatments such as vitamin B6 supplements followed by gluten-free, casein-free diet may place a child at risk for nutri nutrient deficiency. So if you do put someone on a gluten-free diet or casein-free diet, you may be uh, at risk for other nutrient deficiencies. Sometimes you're looking at the weight of the individual uh, sometimes they're not getting not enough energy. Um, so if the BMI or is fifth percentile for children aged two to twenty, um, then you want to look at you know how to change that. Medication side effects affecting appetite, limited food choices, secondary to behaviors. So this would be an example of looking at a specific disability and then breaking down the diagnosis and the etiology or signs and symptoms. So we have ASD, we have cerebral palsy. So as you see, there's a lot more nutrition diagnosis. Um, it has altered GI function, food medication interactions, underweight, overweight, swallowing difficulty. So there's different things that um, different disabilities um, have with it. So cystic fibrosis, um, not able to um, get enough fat, um, and not getting enough vitamins because of that. Maybe is it altered GI function? Um, so, with uh, cystic fibrosis, for example, um, it, there's an exocrine gland primarily the pancreas, um, and it's an inherited disorder of the exocrine glands, primarily the pancreas, pulmonary system, and sweat glands, characterized by abnormally thick luminal secretions. Blockages in the pancreas prevents pancreatic enzymes from being available for digestion. So that can lead to some issues, as you see here. So there's some things you need to be uh, cognizant of if, if you had cystic fibrosis. Okay, Down syndrome, um, prater willi spina bifida, these are all different uh, disabilities and, and the different uh, different uh, diagnoses and etiologies or signs and symptoms that you can look at here. So we know that Prater Willi uh, individuals tend to overeat, um, and so they have excessive energy intake, which may lead to overweightness or obesity. Um, there's always gonna there's gonna be overweight and obesity for individuals with Down syndrome as well. Um, unintended weight gain is typically an issue for people with Down syndrome. And
and looking at all the lists for the CP, it looks like they have the most uh, concerns when it comes to health. So just knowing that different disabilities comes with different um, diagnosis and different ways to treat or to help those individuals uh, with their nutrition. I'm not going to go too deep into this, um, but if you were interested in, in looking at meal plan creating for someone in specifically, um, this would be a good reference to look at in the future. As far as nutrition for children, um, many children with disabilities have health issues that can impact their nutritional well-being and eating habits. This makes meeting your child's nutritional needs even more important. Some issues that may affect your child include slower oral motor development, maybe individuals with cerebral palsy, uh, larger tongues, individuals with Down syndrome, smaller teeth, challenges with chewing, food texture preferences, maybe individuals with autism spectrum disorder, constipation, individuals, uh, I think all of the above may have issues, especially with um, cerebral palsy and ASD. Picky eating or eating the same foods, we see that a lot of times with many people with disabilities. We see weight gain, body metabolism burns, fewer calories, we see that a lot of people with disabilities are sedentary. Celiac disease, which is digestional disease and acid reflux. Okay, These are all uh, major issues that we are concerned about for people with disabilities. Uh, what is included? Uh, we talked about what may be included, fruits, vegetables, grains, uh, good fats, whole grains. Um, as far as food groups, how many uh, servings per day uh, based on age and grains, uh, about six ounces for our folks. Veggies, two and a half cups, fruits, two cups, dairy, three cups, and protein, five and a half to six. Now they have that for dairy because of the calcium content uh, also because of the protein content, but if they are dairy-free, then you might want to substitute with some dark greens for the calcium or some almond milk that has calcium fortified. So these are some recommendations for nutrition with children with disabilities. For your project this week in lab, uh, we're officially going to start it today and this week. Uh, so directions, complete this form by, for lecture 5 by 10-6. In week eight, you and your group will decide what meal you will prepare in front of the class in the last three weeks of lab. You can use the groups you are currently in. Tuesday lab, you haven't created groups yet. We'll do that next week. During week 14, 15, and 16, all groups will present their meal in lab. The groups will return their final meal plan from this assignment and upload a YouTube link and reflection related to the assignment. So that's, that's not this one. That's for the actual project. More details in lecture six. So all you're doing here is completing this entire form for lecture five, nothing else. You can do it with a partner. Uh, you can do it with your group if you'd like. Okay, how do you plan a healthy meal? You're going to follow these steps. You're going to talk about the healthy meal you want to make. You're going to talk about the food groups that you're going to combine. You're going to talk about the ingredients in your budget is $10. Okay. How long will it take to prepare the meal? Remember, you should find something that takes 30 minutes or left. 30 minutes or less, I would look at something around 15 minutes. What steps are needed to prepare the meal? Which kitchen supplies are needed and what skills might you need in order to make the dish? So you're gonna have to let me know. Um, use my fitness pal app or happyforks.com to analyze the nutritional content of your meal. Then fill in nutrition information per serving for your meal. For example, a full pizza, one serving may be six ounces uh, or eight ounces. If your meal does, or sorry, probably about three ounces if it was pizza, three to six ounces. If your meal does not meet the requirements, you will need to adapt it by reducing salt, sugar, or fat, adding more vegetables, etc. Note any adaptations in the ingredients list on page one. All right, here we go. I actually don't have that page right now, so don't worry about the, um, for that. So basically, the, the ingredients we want to um, not bring in it would be anything that would be packaged, um, anything that will be really unhealthy for them, like chips or anything that isn't going to be made. And I can talk more about that in, uh, in lecture six when we actually create these plans. Okay. You can tell me <clears throat> how many calories, how much total fat, saturated protein, carbs, fats, 
fiber, sugar, sodium, iron, calcium, potassium, vitamin A, C, or others. So make sure they fill this in. And then nutritional requirements for this assignment, it has to be less than 700 calories. Um, oh, here's my uh, list here. So nutritional requirements for this, this assignment, so less than 700 calories per serving, less than 25 grams of fat per serving, less than 8 grams of saturated fat per serving, must have at least 10 grams of protein, must have at least 5 grams of fiber, no trans fat. <clears throat> Choose heart healthy foods that are low in saturated fats. Sauces such as low sodium soy sauce, balsamic vinaigrette, rice vinegar, wasabi, or ginger are healthy, low calorie choices. I'd also add apple cider vinegar in there. Omega 3 fat is good for your heart and brain. Salmon has omega 3 heart healthy fat. Most kids eat too much salt. Keep that salt shaker off the table. Healthy oils come from fish, nuts, and liquid oils like grapeseed oil, avocado. Keep your heart healthy with lots of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Use leftover chicken. So these are some smart tips. Um, but again, <clears throat> I would try to refrain from using any type of meat for this lesson. Okay. Always wash your fruits and vegetables. Try leaving the peel on the apple for more fiber. Broccoli is a superhero of vegetables with vitamin A, calcium, folic acid, and vitamin C. So I definitely recommend using broccoli. Um, soluble fiber keeps your cholesterol levels down and dark green leafy vegetables are high in iron and choose foods in their natural state like oranges instead of orange juice. That's going to be it. If you want to look at more resources you can look at my adapted uh, you can look at the adapted toolkit for lesson planning. Uh, you can look at my document resources and nutrition websites. Okay. If we go back to our class portal you notice that um, I have everything in our assignment folder now. So once you click on here, you just click on homework reflection number five, and you'll click on this lecture. Hopefully you've already done that. And this is the worksheet that you're gonna turn in for three points, all right? So if you have any questions, just reach out and we'll see you all in lab next week. Thanks a lot.